So first of all, thank you for coming today. Our availability at the end of the season was obviously scattered with uh, the two teams in different parts of their season and uh, with the Thorns playing on the road and uh, traveling, etc. So appreciate you uh, taking the time and being patient. So the summary of the season, I think uh, everyone's heard Merritt's uh, comments, which I, I think uh, are very valid. Uh, I think the expectations for the Thorns are to, to be a team that, that challenges for, for the championship and getting knocked out in Chicago on the road was disappointing. And I, I think, again, going back and saying how and why, it's easy to, in hindsight, saying we could have or should have done things differently. But ultimately, in looking at where we were at the end of the season, we, we wanted to be in the championship. And in all honesty, you know, should have things gone a slightly different way, we could have. And uh, I think the challenges that we faced and the struggles that we had, we need to grow and learn from. But in looking at the representation of the Thorns in the community and the brand as a whole, it's phenomenal. And it still leads the way in many, many categories, both in the players that want to join us as an organization, the relevance of the game and driving the NWSL and being a strong talking point within the women's game worldwide. And I think if you take that back a, a, just a little bit and say, one of the major positives were that we led our season average and our overall attendance for the season led the way in the world with any women's professional sports team. And I think that's representative of, of us as an organization, representative of the, the job that we're doing both on the field and off the field, but also the relevance, relevance of the game within Portland. So I think they uh, are, are a, well, that is a very strong point. It's very relevant and it allows us to continue to grow. So from that standpoint, you know, we're optimistic about uh, the direction. We're optimistic about what we think we're, we need to address and, and how to address it. So from my standpoint, we've closed another chapter and now we've got to open the, the way to next year. So from my point, that's, uh, that's just about it. Yeah, just to, without repeating and, and to build off that, of course, uh, there was there was some extreme positives, the the, the attendance record and, and seeing this this community and this fan base continue to connect and develop the, str the, the, the strong, unique, loving relationship with this team and supporting through thick and thin, and especially during the World Cup period when we're, we're missing you know, as, as many as anybody else or the most amount of, of international players what we'll be able to achieve as a team in performance and results during that that period is a huge factor of of what this fan base, whether we're on the uh, at home or away, um, the way that that connection is continued to build is is inspiring. And yeah, there's there's been positives throughout the season. The way we finished the last five regular season games were nowhere near the standard that we've previously held ourselves to in this in the stretch. It's a part of the season that you've we've come accustomed to being. Uh, at our best and flying on all cylinders. Um, the 19 games before that, I thought we did a tremendous job to manage all the challenges. The players specifically did uh, an outstanding job um, stepping up, stepping in, and also growing and developing and evolving the spirit and the culture of the team. But those last five games obviously are going to be sour for a while and we have to continue to strive and look forward to, to grow and evolve and learn from lessons, starting with lessons from the coaching staff. And then we look at the playoff game. Um, regardless of how the regular season finished, um, because you know it's it's fair to say, well, momentum and the challenges and the way the team was performing, um, not surprising to see that that result. But it is surprising because regardless of how the, the the regular season finished in a knockout game, especially the experience that we have as a staff, we have it on the roster. Uh, it was a disappointing finish, starting with with me and how we obviously set up to attack that game and adjusted throughout the game. Um, that's a game that we. Nine times out of ten, we should be taken care of and heading to a championship. That's going to fuel us. That's going to fuel us to, to raise the standard and raise the bar in every element of what makes a successful team. And in the in the locker room, on the pitch, off the field, continue to raise the standard for us to be able to drive um, and meet the expectations of what this club has in the women's game, not just here but across the world. When you look at kind of the, how the season finished, those last five games and, and getting knocked out in the playoffs, what do you take away from that and learn, especially heading into next year, uh, an Olympic year, um, particularly given that it seems like the time of the season where you guys sort of faded was when you got your national play team players back after a big tournament? Yeah, there was. I mean, there was a short period where, let's say, game 19, right, game, up to up until game 19, we we're in a fantastic position. So there was still there was a number of, of games after the World Cup period where 
Um, things weren't looking perfect, and you can tell the, the mental, emotional, and energy levels weren't perfect. However, the results were still there, and the performance needed to continue to improve, but we're scoring goals. We're, we improved the defensive side incredibly since the beginning of the season. Uh, and, then, and then from yeah, game 19 and uh, game yeah, 19, it, it turned, game 19 and game 20, things started to turn. There's going to be lessons for the Olympic year. I think uh, on the tactical side, it's very clear of, of style of play at the beginning of the season and how we evolved during the World Cup period, which I think was a huge success in building to the strengths of and, and trying to bring out the best in our players. And that final stretch, um, whether, whether we're, we're at home or away in that, that, that stretch, I think the style of play uh, at times got caught in between what had been successful in different stages of the season. And, and we needed to continue to, to evolve to have a very clear on what what our expectations were um, in, in attacking and defending against the, the oppositions that have been a bit more consistent in, in the way they they address the season. Um, and then, so I'd say that from my standpoint and then from, from me managing and supporting and us managing the players, the World Cup year is, is a massive calendar 12-month year for the athletes. Uh, and and I think we all, we all fell into the trap a little bit of the mentality of our group because we've got some special... Um, players and their mentality that it takes its toll. Uh, I wish I wish I gave them a little bit more time to adjust. I wish I, I supported them a little bit more at the same time, if they would let me, because they 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 are, they're very proud of representing this team and being here for this club. Um, so there's lessons there. But I, I I went through this in 2015. I felt like I had huge lessons to take from there that we that we brought into this this World Cup year. It's very different. Even though it's similar to an Olympic year, the demands of a World Cup year is is unique. Um, well, obviously, we have to learn some more lessons, you know. I don't think, and I don't think that that journey will will ever stop of of how how you can progress and evolve. But but certainly, from our side, number one, being accountable and reflecting and reviewing, and some of the things I just discussed. And of course, it's important that everyone does that. Every individual, every player, every staff member, and, we're, and that's the period we're in right now. Um, and then um, I guess maybe more for Gavin, but. Uh, uh, you, this team has had a lot of count continuity in recent years. Mm -hmm. How much roster turnover can we expect this off season, and or much at all? And mm -hmm. uh, what positional needs will the team be going after? Without getting into too many specifics, I, I think going uh, back to the, the season and the number of players that we carried, I think there's a focus on possibly, not possibly, but uh, increasing the, the quality of the foreign spots making sure that every foreigner that comes in is better than the player that we can acquire domestically. So making sure that our foreign spots go back to the Amandine Henri caliber and making sure that we maximize those in every way. The, the league continues to evolve and I'm sure there will be or could be uh, an evolution of the rules to allow for a, a greater investment in foreigners. And I think that will come back to the league and start to benefit uh, every single club that, that's willing to invest. So one, maximizing the foreign spots, there's three foreign spots four that we can start to use it should we be able to uh, effectively fill the positions that we need so I, I think three four five starting caliber players and I will not get into the, the specifics of the positions that we need but obviously there, there will be quite a, a little bit of, of roster turnover and we've still got the, the main players some of the best players in the world in their key positions but again starting to increase the caliber of the player and, and overall the group I think this is a club and this is a team that needs to be in the championship and contesting for trophies every single year. So we need to do what we need to do. Gavin, how do you balance having those national team stars, those proven personalities and, and nine players in the World Cup versus a team that may has more continuity throughout the year and doesn't have as big a challenge in these years? I think uh, if you look at the World Cup, when the World Cup ended, I think we were sitting in first with the roster that we had. So I think the depth that we had at that stage of the year was very, very important. And picking up the results that we picked up, especially on the road, showed the, the quality of the player and the quality of the preparation and coaching that went into that group. So I think for this season, part of the emphasis was to make sure that we had more depth to manage the World Cup and to manage nine players going. And at other parts, I think at one stage of the year, we had 11 players on international duty and we still had to manage it and we still got a result. So. The depth this year was very, very important. The roster rules have allowed for us to carry a lot more players. And sometimes when you carry more players, whether there's a, a level of indecision that happens within the entire organization or, or whether it starts to create a, a group where it's impossible to keep too many players happy, 
quite often when you have a smaller group and a focused group and there's consistency week in, week out, it does tend to equal greater things. However, in managing it in a World Cup year or in an Olympic year, you still have to have adequate depth. So I think that the starting group needs to get better. And if the starting group gets better, the squad and the quality of the squad and the competition for places will take care of itself. Some of the starters will ultimately become squad players. So. And Mark, um, I'm thinking back to when Gabby got hurt. Um, you talked to her as a, about her as a potential uh, rookie of the UK at eight. I mean, injuries are part of everything, but let's talk about that injury in particular because, maybe I'm wrong, but it seemed like you kind of missed some of her ability to win the ball and distribute at times late in the year. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting phase. We'd, we'd lost Angela Salem not not soon before that, Gabby Sila, Andrew Senior picked up a short-term injury, Celeste Bure had a, had a short-term injury and a quick surgery. So those four centre midfielders uh, went went down in a very short period. Um, and credit to the players uh, that, that were available to be able to, to perform and consistently, consistently because we probably weren't going to be able to take many more uh, in that position not being available. Uh, I, I thought, and at right at the end there, we got to see we got to see the qualities of Emily Ogle, who didn't get the opportunity throughout the year, and more more reason for um, for the, the roster rules allowing to develop and give players an opportunity. Um, she was doing that for months before she got on the pitch against Washington for for the first start. Uh, Gabby, um, I think, provided us something very different and, and unique with the, the the versatility she has, and I think what you you touched on there, she was she was uh, nicknamed Pick pickpocket silent near near the mid, middle of the season because she would she'd be stealing things from everyone on the field and and sneaking up and but her qualities and I remember we talked about it at the beginning of the season her qualities on the ball obviously very good she can beat people on the on the dribble she can play with either foot and she's a decision maker she's a she's a playmaker a quarterback a, a point guard in 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 the game and and man able to read the game so she's she's a young player obviously returning from injury and doing a good job but she's a young player that has a great future in multiple positions and it was cool for us to see see her consistently in center mid uh, after obviously we had we had a couple of injuries there but it was you know, it was a, it was a it was one of the challenges in, in a crucial position in the area of the field. If you look at us over the years, it's it's an area that we always have great depth and quality, uh, and we took some blows there in in a crucial stage. Um, and, and Gabby gave us not just in midfield; she gave us some great options, which which pushed us forward. You know, especially in that when we set up to game 18, 19, when we we're in first place, um, it definitely took its toll. Not having uh, uh, Gabby and other players and Ange, and same with every other team. You know, there's and there was teams that got hit a little bit harder than that, so it's it's tough to to zoom in there too much. But yeah, it's exciting exciting to see her recover, see Andrew recover, and be able to be better in the future. Mark, you mentioned the end of the season, the last five games. Uh, did the Carolina result uh, you think hurt the confidence of the team going down the stretch? I think the Utah game before then, when we should have been five. Five nil, six nil at halftime, or three, four nil at halftime. We were one nil down. I think that game really hit us hard um, just before the Carolina game. Uh, I think the Carolina game is it was a it was a game where you, where we every single one of us have to apologise to everyone associated with the Thorns because it wasn't a represent, res, representation of us. But what came in that in those days after was a group uh, very clearly wanting to. Uh, rally and come together and grow and be stronger and give to each other even more. So I'd say Utah just before um, the Seattle away game, just before the international break near the end of the season. Utah and Seattle, I think there were two two games that performance or result wise, there were games that in the past um, we've taken care of. There were massive games that we've taken care of and they got away from us. The Carolina game was 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 something obviously you never want to go through again. But the the way the group came together throughout the, the days after, rallied before we played Houston, started to pick up some real momentum before the away game in Seattle. Uh, and and, and the, the, I think the challenge with, with that end of the stretch that, that also er, every other team faced, but for us now it, it's, it's Dagny and Anna as well, the, the FIFA date before that Utah game, trained once before that, before same, same as Utah, just our quantity grew from nine to now 11, 12 going away on FIFA dates. And then the Seattle game, we had a we had a very disappointing loss, and then we got people around the other side of the world. Some of them only trained two times in in, in the two weeks building up to the Chicago semi-final. A couple of them trained uh, just twice. Um, it, it took its it certainly took its toll. And at the same time, it's taken its toll. I think in my reflection of of, of me and, and our performances, we certainly could have could have managed things a bit better in in, in hindsight. 
Um, but yeah, those challenges, they, they, you can plan for them for big periods near the end of the season. Those two FIFA dates certainly caught me off guard in the, in the sense of the toll it takes on the group because I thought we'd got over that hump and then suddenly more come and more players are leaving. We've got players coming back from Europe. Um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. But I'd say Utah-Seattle, they were two tough games. The, the Carolina game brought the, the group closer and really pushed us to rally in what was crucial and most needed um, in this final stage. And then I'll add one part. We should never get beaten by that at home, regardless of what we go through. So 100%, having the best fan base in the world and the highest attendance has to equate to something. So from our part, it's a motivation that it never happens again. Simply embarrassing. That's um. I was going to ask you, Gavin, you've been in uh, Portland a long, long time. Um, how proud are you of the fans? Um, you know, they over 20,000 for every game. It's, uh, it's incredible. It becomes a massive talking point everywhere we travel. And it, it actually, beyond that, it's like how. And trying to rationalize how is impossible. I, I think it's a unique community. It's an, it's an incredible community where they get behind you know, women's soccer to the point that no one else does it in the world. And so just how special we are as a community, how special we are as a soccer city, it, it, it's highlighted by the fact of what the Thorns bring. And it's also relevant to the coach and the coaching staff and the players that we have. I think they generally take the Carolina game out of the equation, right? That, that's an anomaly. That generally week in, week out, it's a tremendous representation of who we are in this city. And, and it deserves that level of support in some ways, but we are still honored and privileged to have it. But when I travel, even on the men's side to different parts of the world, the, one of the, the constant talking points and topics is how the heck does this happen on the women's side? And when we start talking about the makeup of the team, the staff and everything else, and how we recognize it and how we honor the, the, the women's game in Portland, it is unique. And, uh, you know, hopefully we continue to grow and hopefully we continue to bring in championships. And I think that not only adds a layer of pressure, it, it adds, you know, internal pressure, outside pressure, but relevance of what we're doing and how important it is. And Mark, just your, uh, are you stunned at how many fans you've got here? Come on. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was great to hear Gavin talk about that. I mean, he's just come back from, from a trip around, around the world and same here, same here, the, the communication I get from all around the around the globe about, about the standard that, that Thorns fans, Riveters set. And, and look, it's a community, it's a city, and it's a fan base um, that has rallied around the history of soccer in this, in this town, on the men's and the women's side. You know, the, the, the players that have played just down the road at, at UP and, um, and the wonderful job that previous coaches have done in this city. Uh, and there's also some absolute core, core, core critical fans that, that help rally these thousands of people. There's some dedicated individuals that make sure it's possible to, to unite and come together. Um, it still still hits me catching up with my wife after the first home game in 2016. She couldn't wait to tell me all the range of people she saw sitting in the parking lot wait, waiting to um, waiting for a friend to come into the game and, and seeing every type of person, male and female, all ages, walking, catching a bike, getting off the bus, getting off the taxi or train, the amount of different range of people that come and support our team and a reflection of the, the individuals in the fan base that, that have built that, the individuals in the history of this club. Gavin's been here for a while, doing a wonderful job and there's, and there's people that, that have been here way before uh, Gavin and, and others, key figures on the men's and the women's side. Uh, and, and for us to have that torch and to be driving that forward with, with what you know, the, the players that, that have been here at this club since 2013 and the players that are here right now, the, the, not just their talents on the field, but the character and who they, who they represent themselves as and how they represent this organisation, it continues to drive us forward. Gavin, kind of going off of that, and this may be more of a question for Merit, but maybe you can speak to it as well. You've talked about how the Thorns fans lead the league. They are so much more numerous than a lot of the other NWSL fans. In this offseason, as your players continue to push for equal pay, equal opportunity, yeah. what kind of responsibility does that place on the front office to make sure that the Thorns as an organization are also leading that charge among the NWSL and women's soccer around the world? I think one of the things that we, and again, it could be a question for Merritt and Mike in addition to myself, but I think we continue to raise the bar. We, we continue to drive equality within the organization. We continue to drive every mechanism in which we treat the athletes, work with the athletes, the staffing, the, the ability to provide them what we provide everyone on the men's game. And 
it, you can see it truly exists. I, I think us as an organization, uh, we have both the Timbers and the Thorns in the top 10 uh, average attendance record within uh, Canada and the US uh, with both the, the MLS and the NWSL. So from an organizational standpoint, I think we foster that, that, that true belief that there is a quality within the sports. I, I think some of it needs to be solved at a federation level and that will trickle down through the clubs, but I think we continue to drive the standard within the NWSL. We continue to recognize and respect every single individual player and I, I think we've been on the forefront as far as increasing the, the payroll, increasing the minimum wage, increase, increasing the the ability to provide better fringe benefits for players and uh, I, I think we will continue to I know I don't think we will continue to drive that we will increase resources that we give to the players and we'll also look to increase every aspect of what we're doing which is why we also need success on the field to continue the belief and the drive towards what we're doing is the right approach Are you guys anticipating an expansion draft um, this fall, and how are you preparing for that, if so? We will anticipate that. <laughs> okay. So uh, I think we have to prepare for it. So if we're looking at previous years and we're looking at expansion drafts and we're looking at what the previous rules were and how we prepare the roster for next year, I, I think we have to be fluid and flexible. Uh, I think when you start to look at the, the evolution of where we are right now, we be we've benefited off the expansion draft and being able to perform certain trades that have benefited us to, to this stage. And I, I think the expansion draft that could or should or happen will, will be a positive again and starting to grow, the uh, continuing to grow the league is another positive. So we have to look at the big picture and not just our picture. But again, we have to prepare for it and we'll adjust accordingly. Uh, Coach, when you look back at this season, uh, end of the year notwithstanding, what's something that you sort of look at as something you want to carry forward into next year, into next season? The Houston result at home. That was a nice game. Um, I would say uh, as, we, as we started to come back together, uh, after eight away games at the beginning of the season, the eight away games, the adversity you go through on the road, and it's not just on the road, it's West Coast travel. You know, the travel um, going going east is, is tough. Um, getting through that, getting through the World Cup period when almost every player had returned, you know, we had a, we had a meeting and we discussed, um, we discussed obviously some good things and some challenges we'd gone through, but what, what was the most, cr what was stronger than ever in our team, in, in our culture, in our performance and how we train and uh, the group had, had been very clear that the spirit of the team near the end of that stage had never been stronger and and we had committed to the, sp the spirit and the culture and the commitment from players from staff to the team um, and I had never enjoyed and, and been a part of such a strong uh, togetherness. Um, we, had, we had obviously com we had identified that and committed that, that w without that you don't win anything um, without that, you can't compete for trophies. With that only, you also you're not going to compete with trophies. We had to build. We had we had built that laid the foundation for this for this season. Um, we developed our our spirit, our culture, our mentality, and our standards. Um, and we uh, and to look back and how how proud I am of of everyone doing that before World Cup and during the World Cup and being on the road through those challenges. Um, it's a, it's and and then it's a shame that when things got if anything, a little bit easier for us near the end, um, things dropped. That was probably my, my most valuable part that when things were our, our hardest and we had the more adversity thrown at us, the way that our group came together and strengthened, it's something that, that has to inspire what the future of this team and the future of, of our um, on and off the field performance looks like because it's, it's, that's what it comes down to. They're the very, very top, top teams, top players, the way that you, um, the way that you connect um, as a group of players and staff is key, and um, it was special to see how they did that. Any last comments from Gavin or Mark? Just a little bit of information. So Ali Carpenter, obviously one of the best young players in the world, in our opinion. There'll be an announcement hopefully tomorrow that we've extended her deal uh, for multiple years. Uh, still waiting for the league to officially approve it and go through some formal changes relative to league rules, etc. But that's a little bit of uh, positive news. 
relative to the Thorns, and we have a couple of others uh, that are out of contract that uh, we're in discussions with that we're trying to bring back. But when we start to maximise our, our foreign spots and when we start to look at can we get some of the best players in their respective positions, I think Ali Carpenter is definitely a reflection of that. Gavin, can you just speak to the challenge of the international player? I mean, you saw Mandy go away, money part of the yep. team. How, how can this league, that you with Sam Kerr or whoever it is, mm -hmm. compete with big budget teams, or, or how do you approach that? So many things. I think short term is a different solution, obviously. I, I think if every team was where the thorns were, I think every ownership group would feel comfortable investing the required resources. However, as a league, we're, we're still in its infancy in some ways. It's a lot more secure. The professionalism is definitely increasing year in, year out. Minimum wage will continue to improve, which obviously drives the higher level as well. I think as we start to create resources outside of the cap to bring in special players, you'll start to get the uh, Amandine Henri's back into the league and some of the others and be able to keep a Sam Kerr, for example. But I think we are going through that evolution as a league and addressing it. On the flip side, the US just won the World Cup. So the methodology and the rationale behind what's happening and getting uh, the right players in the right markets and in a competitive league day in, day out where every team gives you a, a good challenge, I think is also a positive. So making sure that the whole league continues to flourish rather than just one or two teams. So I think you'll see the, the growth in that area for sure.